but I, you know, I don't, I don't haven't used Blender because it, it, it sounds like another one of these things is going to take me a lot of investment of my time to get there. But oh, it sounds so, so cool. That would be a fun project to work uh, with some of that. Take some of these videos I have that are just really poor quality and cut and paste them and do transitions and all kinds of things like that. And then do like 3D animation, you know, in, in between the, the uh, transitions and uh, you know, just there's just a ton of stuff out there that looks like fun fun to do with Blender. Unfortunately, that's one of the places that uh, open source software still kind of falls short, with Photoshop in particular, yeah. and um, with video editing. Um, the and I've seen a lot of even open source advocates say, "I'm doing professional video. I still need um, Premiere. Yeah. I still need Premiere to do video professionally because it's just." It just has the actual tools that I need, whereas open source, it they just don't quite have it yet. And not, and not just the tools, the licenses for the special formats for like if you want to make a DVD or a Blu-ray, you can't do that with well, you can do DVDs because that was probably years ago, but you still can't do that with Blu-ray yet, actual Blu-ray video. Right. Not yeah, you can't do Blu-ray, stick it in any Blu-ray drive, and it'll just right. work. There's a pseudo workaround called AVC, but that doesn't always work with every player. Well, so I wonder if the, the technologies will start to be driven by open source. You know, here we're saying video, we're just not there yet. And there's some proprietary add-ons that make the proprietary video much better. But is that really what's going to continue to be the case? Is there these companies that are these you know, massive investments in their software to keep ahead really going to be able to keep that up if, if everyone, you know, just donates time and effort to these free... Uh, Effort free projects. I would say the proprietary is going to keep ahead, and not because of the money they're dumping into it and the money we have to pay for it, but because of the licensing that is necessary for those specific formats. If you want to make an official Blu ray disc to sell on a shelf, you have to have these formats, and you have to pay the movie industry to look for the licenses to use those formats. So it's the industry behind. The, the selling of the products that's going to keep it. Well, and I, I, I hope that that works. I mean, I hope I they hope continue to have that some. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the fact that I can get a real high quality video and watch something that's really good in, and enjoy that. Uh, I you know, don't want to get into the Betamax thing where now you have a whole bunch of stuff you've purchased and you want to use and you can't. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a good situation to be in. But I'm just wondering, you know, this one. One area maybe it won't work, you know, with open source taking the lead, but certainly there's been other domains or other types of things where suddenly the open source sort of just knocks aside everything else. I mean, it doesn't seem like it'd be too hard for people to stop using Blu-ray because it's a media format that doesn't make sense when you're downloading a file from the internet, right? And a, a good example of that is actually um, MP4. Or WebM. Or WebM, yeah, which is fantastic. What is it? WebM. Okay, I don't know what that is. It's a container format, and I think Google's one of the big it's, ones pushing it. was it. Google that um, actually came up with the original uh, code for it, and the, the, the uh, original specs for it. Okay. Yeah. But the WebM, I think, is just a container format like Matroska. And or then or like an MP4. Right, and, then, and then they've got whatever codec behind it, usually the Theora or something. But if you check out uh, YouTube, they, I forget how exactly to get to it. It's a slash HTML5, I think, will get you, uh, you know, these access WebM formats. And for the most part, they look beautiful. And oh, they yeah. play natively without, ne without a necessary add-on. Right, with, browsers. yeah, without Flash, well, which most, is banished uh, from all of my machines. Yeah. Most, uh, most browsers. Well, that was a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say most browser, all browsers with the exception of, um, like IE, which doesn't have full support for HTML5, but HTML5 um, has native support for um, WebM and uh, well, H H H H H is what you're thinking. Yes, thank you. That's it. Although there's a bit of controversy over that because there's some sort of overlap. Like IE supports H.264 and something else, and then Firefox doesn't support. Yeah. So there's a disconnect is what you're saying. So it's going to be the Betamax problem, potentially. Well, I, I think it'll converge on something, same, I hope. I hope, uh, 
it depends. It, it all depends on what people decide to support. Which, uh, like the VHS Betamax, all the manufacturers decided to go with VHS because it was cheaper. Not because it was higher quality, but because it was cheaper. Um, the same thing with um, using Blu-ray instead of uh, HD DVD. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, there were all these people that went with HD DVD because they thought that was going to be the new format, and we went with Blu-ray instead. Because it was easier to say, right? I think it was um, mainly because they had more support. Like it had Sony in particular was a big backer of it. If you can, the problem is if you can get these big companies like Sony, Samsung, to actually support these open formats, then then it will become the standard. Well, but so they're choosing not to. Well, so you know, it's like the Microsoft walking walking away from their old version of software. They, they're not going to support XP. Now you've got the problem with you know a vulnerability in the browser environment where you're going to have people who you know. So, are, so you didn't back up patched anyways. Yeah, they patched it anyways. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you know the it's idea is they have to do. Bug. Yes. <laughs> But you know the idea is that there, you know, there's going to be these big companies that make decisions that really move some of these industries one way or another, right? That's your point. Yeah. And so yeah, it'll be interesting to see of the open source software that all of us are finding and using to and, and getting use out of every day, how much of those big companies are going to be influencing what we we use, you know, two years down the road. That's going and to that be. That may a, not be a bad thing either, because you know we have the big evil proprietary corporations, but then we also have the the big open source companies too, things like Red Hat, um, Susie, yeah, mm -hmm. um, Google, oh, so Comical. Susie's Oracle now, so it's, yeah. Uh, the, well, there's a, I mean, it's still got good open source backing, <laughs> but the actual owners of it is Oracle. Is you have to take the good with the special yeah, right now, exactly. Oracle special sometimes. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Java and uh, Android. Yeah, that controversy. But even going back to Blender, let's not forget that that started out as a proprietary tool for industry, by industry, to be a top-of-the-line thing. I mean, Blender was written to make Hollywood-quality movies. And, you know, it later got open-sourced, and I argue that it's improved since then. So, you know, open-source doesn't have to mean you know, a slightly paler version of... Well, and so also, also I think we've got this concept that we're dragging us down that open source is harder to use. You have to be an expert or you have to spend a lot of time getting to understand how to do something. But that may be because now you're able to do things you couldn't do before. You're not just typing in text, you're going to do all kinds of formatting and stuff like that, you know. Geeks are inherently lazy. They would rather write a piece of software to redo this simple task over and over again instead of typing in the same commands. Which is why the geeks will have this uh, this great command line tool, but they'll still write a GUI for it because it's simply easier to click these check boxes and click OK than to actually go through the uh, text config file and type out the commands or edit it by manual. Some would be sure. Five hundred page man. Five. Yeah. So, what other software are people using? Is there anything that somebody wanted to talk about that didn't get a chance to? Uh, Reminded me, I actually use Mumble on a regular basis. I don't think for that. Chat. It's like yeah, it's, it's basically like open source Ventura or Teamspeak. And I don't. I have a Linux server that just runs out of my house, so run Debian, and I just run that on top of it all open source. And I can communicate with some old friends that don't live around here anymore. What um what protocol is that using? I think Speaks. I can tell you for sure. I mean, um, is is it using the is it using like a Jabber or? It's a voice chat. Oh. I think it's like Speaks plus Jabber. Oh, okay. it's that does have text chat as well. Gotcha, okay. But I mean, uh, besides the hardware cost and electricity and networking, that was basically free. Did you mention it was encrypted? It is encrypted, yeah. Uh, it's, you, is it using TLS or OpenSSL? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I did patch all my servers up. So you said do you use that more for just like talking to people, yeah. or do you use it for gaming as well? I, I do. Thank um, you. It's very low bandwidth, so it doesn't interfere a lot with 
Yeah, really it's like. designed for gaming, so it has low latency, low bandwidth, and I use it for that. But um, also, you know, I've been kind of a geek, so I spend a lot of time on my computer. If I have friends that are also on the computer all the time, why not both jump on here and we can talk while we're doing it? Yeah, so there was a, a time when I was into some, some video video conferencing, right? And there was a uh, big blue button was this software that's available for free, but it's, you know, you download it and put it onto your server, and then you host the video conferencing that way. I was trying to get PenguinCon to use that too. You know, it'd be nice if you're in your room in the hotel and you're going to miss this discussion, you just jump on a video chat and watch it from your room, you know. Except that, for the infrastructure here would not support right. that. So I mean, it's already dragging right. with all the geeks right. on there. Yep. 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 So, so I get that. I get that. <laughs> so, you know, the idea, though, was that there's other things coming out like Google+. Plus. So now I'm finding Google+, Plus. you know, a couple of buddies of mine are in, into that, and we can use that to do our video conference. Hangouts, yeah. yeah. Hangouts is actually pretty cool. I mean, I wish they... Uh, I would really like to see that protocol that they're using open sourced and be able to actually use it myself for my own stuff. That would be really cool, I think. Because that's actually really efficient. Just be, a group video chat. Yeah. Be able to run it off of your own server so that you know it's private. I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about, you know, it's going through a third party so you don't necessarily know what they have and they don't have. So the NSA thing, right? I mean, we don't know what Google has released and what all these other big companies are, are and, providing. And I mean, um, there was that also the scare where they uh, where they were talking about uh, Bull Run, where they, oh, we can see what's going between inside of Google centers and they don't even know about it. Right. So, I've I personally have been going the way of I want to run at least my own versions of a lot of things just because I actually know where it's stored and how it's uh, how it's actually being transported on this. I'd rather run my own database server and stick something up on the cloud. Yes. Even though we know there's more cost involved because this big corporation can um, just have these massive racks which cost them, which is why it just costs you like 10 bucks a month to host terabytes of information versus doing it yourself, which would be you know, 300 bucks for the hard drive, thousands of dollars for a RAID server, you know, all this stuff. And they've just provided um, pennies on it. You can always get stuff cheaper. I can't, I bought mine at a flea market one day. 45 bucks for the server, uh, two dual core Opteron and a uh, troll cat, troll slot RAID cat for 50 bucks. Well, so that, that's a... Running SAS. So is, is a cheaper hardware going to make your choices on software different? So yes, yes. I mean, so now I'm going to use RAID instead of just a you know, single hard drive. With I'm the cheaper hardware, I know I cannot run Windows 2012 or 20, 2008 server. I ha I'm going to be well, not forced, but I'd have to use both three or even or 2000, heaven forbid, or or you can I could go with FreeBSD or OpenBSD and have very stable and. Well, Man, OpenBSD, you could run that on a I know. on a uh, DOS machine and get better performance than a Windows 2012 server. I don't know, that's the, that's the funny thing about it. It's something works better than Okay, so we just have a, have a minute. I just want to give an opportunity to anybody who wanted to say something to speak up. You got, what kind of open source software are you using every for everyday use? No, yeah, I live in it day to day. Oh, there you go. So what, what is it you're using? What's that? What are you using for... What are you using for open source software every day? VI. VI, okay. Yeah, you know, good point. We didn't even get into how geeks might use, you know, we're, it's a whole, whole area there with, you know, the, the VI is available on a lot of different platforms, you know. I thought I thought it was only available on computers, but I just found out that you can get it on your phone now too. Oh really? Yes. <laughs> oh, I don't know how well that would work. I don't know. I haven't been inspired to try it. I, if I'm doing using my phone for a text editor, I've got bigger problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so I got into that. I, I want to be able to you know um, work on a server that's down or having not down having problems. For my cell phone, I know I want to have an SSH client. I want to have FTP things like that, and it was it was difficult to find some of those. You know, SSH is well supported though. Yeah. It's a good SSH. Client. Well, he means if you're running like Windows, then you still have to 
find all these. Yeah, so Windows. So, uh, Windows. Windows put, there's a client called Putty that's excellent for Windows. Well, yeah, I mean, but it's, um, the idea is it that with Linux, most mm -hmm. of these basic tools like FTP, SSH, all of these clients are just built in. Right. Yeah. right, so if you're on a cell phone, does that cell phone have even a client you can find somewhere, you know? Yep, there's very good cell phone clients for SSH. Um, I, I just wish the keyboard was better sometimes. So, so, so how many times, sometimes. Yeah, how I've solved the keyboard problems, I have an external Bluetooth keyboard yeah. that I have phone. Yeah, trying to do that with soft keys. You... It's no fun. The, that's why you have a special keyboard like the hacker keyboard, which actually gives you the control of all tabs, keys, yeah. which are necessary for doing that work. The client but, that I use for SSH on my phone has it's got software uh, meta key built in. So you've got your escape key, your control oh, cool. key. So you could also do Telnet? Yeah. yeah Thankfully yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't connect to a system that's got telnet running on it, so it's really yeah. Yeah, it works well for me that way. Well, that depends. The only time I ever connect to anything with telnet nowadays is if I have to do a console, and I'm not going to be doing console over my phone. <laughs> well, I just wonder if it's going to get to the point where all these wonderful open source software that we're using on laptops and PCs will move down to the cell phones and be available to the non-geek type person who yeah. suddenly finds out, oh my gosh, this thing is really cool and, and actually make cell phone versions is. of um, Even, um, I've been looking at software defined radio and you can get a software defined uh, radio dongle for $20 and there's already a app that you can plug into your, so you get an OTG cable, plug it into your Android phone and you can browse all the airwaves, everything from uh, ham radio to FM, regular FM and AM. Very nice. Cool. Yeah, okay, well, I got got to wrap it up. I mean, we could probably talk all day about this, and, <laughs> but they want us to end early enough that you get to your next thing. So thank you very much. I thought this was very successful. A lot of fun.